Well, thanks so much. And, you know, thank you to Mission Bio for uh, inviting me this morning to present our uh, recent work on the single cell mutational profiling of AML MRD. So my name is uh, Asiri. I work in Ravi Majedi's lab at Stanford. Um, and I am very interested in both treating and studying patients with acute myeloid leukemia or AML. So AML is a very, uh, you know, disastrous, I would say, diagnosis. It's uh, associated with a poor 27% five-year survival. And if you look at the survival curves for patients with, you know, most types of human cancers here on the right, you can see that patients with AML predominantly do much worse. You know, their survival outcomes are similar to those with pancreatic cancer or uh, brain cancer. So, and here you could see in, in the red line how the survival outcomes have changed for AML uh, over the past couple of decades. And by and large, patients with AML do much worse compared to patients with other common blood and lymphoid malignancy. So there's certainly a clinical need for, how, uh, for improving how we manage and treat these patients. Here, I'm showing you a, a graph um, highlighting a, the potential clinical course for a patient with acute myeloid leukemia who initially presents with you know, high tumor burden or leukemia burden. They receive induction chemotherapy with the hope to induce a deep remission. However, this is often unlikely. The most, a more common scenario is that we were able to drive down the leukemia burden to an extent, but because we're not able to completely eliminate the disease, these patients either relapse early or late, and it's often related to how much residual the disease they have after treatment. Currently, we assess the effect of treatment, uh, you know, after their first round of chemotherapy by looking at their bone marrow under the microscope, and this is what we call our um, clinical remission assessment. And if we're unable to see leukemia under the microscope, we're able to, we say that this patient is actually in a, uh, has achieved a CR or complete remission. However, obviously there's gonna be leukemia present beyond that uh, level of detection. And um, that is in fact the definition of minimal or measurable residual disease, MRD and AML. So that's leukemia cells that persist after chemotherapy below the detection of our routine morphologic evaluation. So, you know, standard morphologic evaluations allow us to detect leukemia cells on the order of one to five in a hundred. Um, currently, there are better or more sensitive clinical assays to detect MRD, like flow cytometry, um, which uses or attempts to detect leukemia by the presence of aberrant surface markers that are commonly present on, present on the leukemia cells. With this technique, you could potentially detect leukemia down to one in 10,000 cells. Mutation-specific PCR is a bit more sensitive. Um, with this technique, you could detect leukemia down to one in a million. However, we only have about very few mutation-specific PCRs that are clinically validated. Um, in addition to detecting MRD, um, we know that all types of residual disease do not, or the different types of residual disease that we can detect don't necessarily have the same clinical implications. And this was highlighted quite nicely in uh, this paper published in 2018, where they saw that patients who had non-DTA mutations at remission actually had a higher risk of relapse than those that did have DTA mutations. And I'll explain what DTA mutations are uh, in the following slide. Uh, of note, in this analysis, they did see that the different types of clinical assays used to detect MRD um, actually worked well together. So if you were positive for MRD with both next generation uh, sequencing and flow cytometry, your risk of relapse was much higher compared to one alone, compared to no detection at all. So here is a graph uh, from that same study um, showing you 
the frequency, uh, the allele frequency of uh, the, the mutation is identified at complete remission. And you can see here that, you know, there are some uh, mutations that are present at fairly high frequency. And the mutations in DNMT3A, TET2, ASXL1, which are common in myeloid malignancies are considered DTA mutations and are more or less markers of clonal hematopoiesis or preleukemia, uh, which is sometimes, which is sometimes referred to, but it isn't a measure of frank leukemia. And these patients aren't at higher risk for developing a early relapse. Um, you know, a lot of patients have this signal, so it is important to differentiate that from other patients. However, you can see that there are other mutations that are present at high VAFs or allele frequencies like in IDH2 and TP53. And we're seeing that these are also potentially common mutations in clonal hematopoiesis. So, you know, it's really important to be able to characterize this phenomenon and distinguish clonal hematopoiesis from true disease causing MRD. Um, I should say that the genomic profiling of AML is very, very important. Um, it is our probably one of our best tools for predicting outcomes in, in these patients. Um, however, it is it still remains imperfect. Um, you know, we could bend patients into favorable, intermediate, or adverse risk categories. Um, however, you know, we're seeing that when patients have co-occurring mutations or multiple mutations, um, these bins uh, tend to get blurred and the vast majority of patients fall in this intermediate category and have highly variable responses. So there's certainly a need to improve this genomic risk stratification and develop tools to allow us to do that. Um, we are also seeing that folks or patients with AML who have more driver mutations uh, tend to do worse. Um, so a question, a primary question that we had um, and that has motivated this uh, the experiments that I'm presenting are, can we better understand the clinical relevance of residual disease by characterizing the clonal co composition of that leukemia? Um, bulk sequencing, bulk next generation sequencing can give us some information about the clonal composition of uh, our sample, of our disease sample. However, you know, there are certain cases where the inferred clonal composition can be variable, like you see here. So um, you know, this profile, mutation profile, can potentially be produced by different you know, um, clonal compositions. And it's important to, you know, accurately delineate what the clonal composition is at remission so you could determine what exactly is the clone that is causing the disease at relapse and to see if it, that clone was actually present at diagnosis. You know, these are important observations or patterns to um, characterize in AML. So we were hoping to use the tapestry platform to perform single cell gene sequencing on patients that have achieved remission to see if we could better, if this tool can enhance our clinical evaluation of MRD. And I should note, you know, this project was done in collaboration <clears throat> with my colleague um, who initially had the idea for this project, Dr. Alex Aleshin, as well as of course my, uh, my mentor and PI, uh, Dr. Ravi Majedi. So, uh, we used the AML panel uh, from Mission Bio, which at the time had 19 uh, hotspot mutations available. And here is a table illustrating or um, showing you the cohort, the patient cohort that we analyzed. I know it's busy, but I should say that uh, we were able to sequence complete remission samples. So this is the time point after that first treatment of chemotherapy where we assess response or not. Um, and we were able to sequence CR samples for 10 patients that eventually relapsed and four additional patients that remained in remission. And, you know, you could see that the, although this is a small cohort, the mutations identified in both groups were fairly similar at remission. And if you look at those that ended up relapsing, we were able to identify the dominant clone at relapse in 44% of the remission samples, which is actually quite good. Um, so to facilitate the subsequent analyses, I took these 14 patient samples, or, um, which comprise of 38 total samples, 
containing approximately 8,000 pre-filtered cells per sample at around 3,000 reads per cell, and converted those to 97 distinct AML clones. So I'm defining clones here as a AML cell with a distinct mutational profile, and use that clone data to perform the subsequent analyses. So here is just the mutational or genomic landscape, say, of all 97 clones, and you're saying that mutations, as expected, that are frequently mutated in AML are also more commonly present or more frequently present in our uh, data set. Interestingly enough, even with just 14 samples, we we're able to recapitulate the mutation order uh, for amongst these clones with you know, a reasonable sense of statistical confidence. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, as expected, mutations in DNMT3A and IDH2 um, occur early and mutations in proliferation specific genes like RAS are occurring later. Of interest, we did see that single cell sequencing did increase our power for detecting uh, co-occurrence relationships among our mutational variants, much more so than bulk sequencing. So here you're seeing uh, the co-occurrence plots with uh, asterisks denoting statistically significant pairs at various uh, significance levels. Um, and we're seeing an improvement in single cell sequencing compared to the deconvolved or aggregated bulk maps that you can infer for single cell sequencing, as well as the TCGA data, uh, which has been subsetted for the variance used in this analysis. We also saw that um, the patients that ended up relapsing had a higher degree of mutations per clone um, compared to those that stayed in remission. And you know, I should say that this is a different observation than saying their patients with more mutations in the sample had higher rates of relapse um, because we're now actually saying that those mutations, those multiple mutations are occurring in the same clone and not just present throughout in the, the sample. Um, we then looked at the clonal ev uh, evolution of our um, of the AML in our amongst our patients, and it is in fact quite heterogeneous, and it highlights the you know the complexity underlying AML and the associated difficulties in managing these patients. So these two cases highlight a a nice example of how the dominant clone at relapse is new and wasn't present at diagnosis. Here we're seeing, you know, what we commonly expect, where the dominant clone at relapse is actually a minor clone at diagnosis that for some reason was selected for during treatment. We're also seeing, you know, several examples of how we could distinguish the disease causing clone um, from a background of clonal hematopoiesis. And um, you know, we're able to detect various amounts of disease using the single cell sequencing platform. And the amount of disease is actually, you know, in this data set, as expected, correlated with the degree of or the duration of relapse. So those with higher levels of disease um, tended to have a sh shorter relapse um, duration. If you look at these two samples here. So, you know, we know that the clonal evolution of AML changes um, arising from normal polyclonal hematopoiesis. Initially, one of these clones acquires a mutation and expands into a pre-leukemic clone, which uh, we're often calling clonal hematopoiesis. And at some point that those clones transform into frank AML, the patient receives therapy and the clonal composition changes. In addition to treatment, there's additional external cell extrinsic stimuli, which is say that influences the clonal composition of leukemia, of cancer in general, um, specifically the bone marrow environment or niche um, inflammation, and as well as interactions with the immune system. So I next wanted to see if we could use our data set to, you know, model or um, gain information on the changes in the clonal composition or diversity and to see if those changes were 
um, had clinical relevance. And to perform that analysis, um, I conducted uh, standard annotation using standard ecosystem metrics. So here, uh, this is an illustration of three different communities with different varying prevalences of species. So you could describe a community, the diversity amongst the community based off of, you know, two general principles, which um, correlates to, or which is often designated as richness. Um, so community richness is related to the number of different species present in that clone. And community diversity is related to the number of different species, as well as the relevant abundance of those species. In our analysis, a species is a clone was considered a individual species and you know the patient sample was considered the community and you can see here all three cases or scenarios have the same number of different clones but community C, or C has a higher proportion of one clone and is considered less diverse than community A which has an even or equal distribution of uh, clonal frequencies so we wanted to see if clonal diversity was clinically relevant, as I mentioned. So I applied those concepts into the analysis of our single cell data set. And you can see, um, if you look at the two metrics here, so the Menhenik index is a measure of richness and Simpson index is a measure of diversity. At diagnosis, there really wasn't a statistical, uh, statistically significant difference in richness. However, there tended to be a, um, higher rate of uh, richness in those that relapse. And um, you could argue that our, our study just wasn't powered to detect this difference. Regardless, with this sample size, we were able to see a very distinct change in clonal diversity. So those that um, remained in remission had a greater decrease in diversity. So there was a lower diversity at remission. And if you use that metric in a multivariate analysis with other standard risk stratification metrics like age, gender, and the ELN risk category, this metric performed much better in terms of predicting those that stay in relapse. And if you split the patients based off of that metric, you could see that you know those that achieve a lower diversity at remission, um, mind you, this is only of the AML subpopulation, those patients tended to stay in relapse for longer. Which is interesting, and you know, it'll be uh, nice to see if this applies to uh, a larger cohort of patients. So, you know, hopefully, with this presentation, I have convinced you that it's not uh, that minimal risk of disease is important. It's not just uh, it's not only important to detect the MRD, but also to characterize, characterize them, um, distinguish the different types of MRD that is present after treatment. So you can see, you know, patients with AML present with a complex clonal composition, they receive treatment. And again, the MRD that we achieve is often heterogeneous. And that type can often influence how we treat those patients moving forward. We believe that single cell sequencing is a good tool to better assess and evaluate residual disease. You know, at the current state is not a replacement for detecting MRD but rather it's a tool to better study the clinical relevance of that residual disease um, because it allows us improved quantification of the co-occurring mutations, um, allows us to distinguish pre-leukemic clonal hematopoiesis from relapse-causing clones, which in turn it, it enables us to identify what is truly clinically relevant MRD, and it gives us insights into the evol evolutionary trajectories uh, of AML during treatment. So, you know, that concludes this uh, talk. I'd like to thank my mentors, Ravi Majedi and Andrew Gentles, um, primarily Ravi Majedi here for this project. Um, both of our labs, as well as colla our collaborators, um, I mentioned Dr. Aleshin, um, as well as everyone at Mission Bio, specifically um, Jose, who is a, a phenomenal resource uh, for this project. My, my department and my funding source. And, um, to all of you for your attention. And if we have time, I'm happy to take some questions. 
Thank you so much, Asir. Uh, that was really great. So we've had a couple of really great questions come through, and I encourage all of the attendees, if more, please use the chat box or the Q&A box um, to ask uh, your questions. So one of the things, were the patients on the therapies? Um, sorry, I, you broke up, so I couldn't uh, hear what you said. I'm sorry. Uh, were the patients on the same therapies? No, they, by and large, they res, um, the patients received standard types of induction chemotherapy. So that's the cytotoxic chemotherapies. But, um, you know, if you look at this table, the specific medicines were different. You know, they were by and large in the same class. And some patients did receive bone marrow transplant. So it is a... Um, somewhat heterogeneous pool of treatments that they received. Great. Sorry about the, the technical difficulties here. Um, so another question, can you un uncover clones with bulk sequencing or other tools like fax or DDPCR? Well, you know, we're defining clones here as cells containing distinct mutational profiles. So um, we wouldn't be able to do that using facts. Um, potentially, you could use multiplex PCR um, if you could devise a PCR panel for, for the variants of interest. And that could, you know, that's another method of determining bulk variant or disease. And you could use that information much like bulk NGS to infer clonal composition, but it doesn't give you the resolution uh, that you can achieve with single cell sequencing in terms of determining the true clonal composition of the of the sample. I see. So, I mean, this is really exciting. We're curious, how do you see this in the clinic or possible um, clinical studies? If you were to test using um, the platform, how often would you want to sample patients? Well, it's always the more samples, the better. But, um, you know, at, at this point, I think the single cell sequencing platform or technology is really nice in giving us more information of about the, the disease at whatever time point that you're analyzing. Um, you know, I think with improvements, maybe we could include that in, in the discussion of whether it's um, a good replacement for actually detecting MRD, but I don't think that's the case currently. Um, it would be nice to uh, use this tool, you know, in clinical trials um, as we're studying uh, patients who receive now novel therapies for, for AML and to just to study how they respond and whether we could glean information about, you know, the co-occurrence pairs, the mutations that are more uh, amenable to certain types of treatment um, and can we use that information to guide how we treat these patients so you know this slide here if I move forward um, really highlights that idea so if we could use single cell sequencing at the remission time point to distinguish you know the complexity of the MR MRD and the types of MRD and then we could use that information to see if this patient needs more treatment should go on to bone marrow transplant or if we could actually devise a targeted therapy against that disease causing clone. Fascinating. All right, I think we have uh, one more question. So I think, you know, it was, you laid it out so nicely how the number of clones and the diversity of clones really uh, kind of affects or predicts which patients will possibly go into remission or for how long. Um, you mentioned that the mutations were similar between the patients that relapse versus those that didn't. And then you also mentioned that you looked at, I think, 93 clones. Were the clones similar or were they different between the patients that went into remission and the, uh, the patients that relapsed and those that didn't? You know, it's that's a difficult thing to say just because um, the sample size is so small, but um, here you could see the actual variants present. 
um, both that diagnosis for those in rem that stay in remission, those that relapse. Um, you know, if you if you look at those that stay in remission, there is a variety of mutations here, you know, and it it's not truly similar to those that um, ended up relapsing, but I would argue that they're not truly distinct either. So, you know, it, it's a hard question to answer with this data set. That makes sense. Well, um, I mean, this is a phenomenal insight into clonality uh, in AML patient samples. And we look forward to hopefully seeing a bigger cohort and even more data because I think, you know, your analysis uh, is just really insightful um, of how clonality matters with AML. Um, Asiri, I wanted to thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, thank you for having me. <laughs> really appreciate it. Um, we hope you're staying safe in the clinic with your patients. And um, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to reach out uh, through email. Thanks so much. Thanks again. Take care, everyone. Bye.